Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Currently, we are going through the Gospel of Mark verse by verse, and we come today to Mark chapter 12, verse 41. So get your Bible if you, if you can. Open it up to chapter 12, verse 41. <clears throat> now, you can study the Bible with me in its entirety. All 66 books of the Bible, all 31,000 plus verses in the English version, the King James Version, study an in-depth, verse-by-verse Bible study with me at your pace, at your convenience. You choose the series. There are four going back over 35 years. You choose the book of the Bible, the chapter, the section, click and listen, or begin in Genesis and go all the way through Revelation. And I encourage you to do that at least once in your life. Study the whole Bible verse by verse. Get the whole counsel of God. There's reason he gave it all to us, right? And that's why I teach it. We need to have a comprehensive view of Almighty God and listen to everything that he has said. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Mark 12, 41. And Jesus sat opposite the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. Now, Jesus is sitting around the temple. This is Holy Week, by the way. And Jesus is sitting around the temple with his apostles. And they're just looking around, looking at what's going on, and they see somebody giving. Now, there were 13 containers in that temple complex. People could drop their offerings into any one of those containers. And so Jesus and his men are in that area watching the people as they give. And it says that, well, let's read 41 and 42 together. Jesus sat opposite the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. Poor is an understatement. Actually, the word means a pauper. This poor widow was in financial ruin. But she gave God the little that she had. 43. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, This poor widow hath cast more in than all they who have cast into the treasury. Jesus wasn't talking dollar-wise or farthing-wise or Darius-wise because her gift was tiny in amount. If you're just looking at numbers, what she gave was minuscule compared to probably everybody else. Those two little coins that she gave amounted to maybe one sixty-fourth of a person's daily wage. Think about that. One sixty-fourth of an average person's daily wage. That's what she gave. Very, very small amount when measured by man's standards. But when measured in relation to sacrifice... It was huge, which is why Jesus said she gave more than anybody else. Always remember this, my friends. God doesn't just measure our gifts to him by how much we give. He measures it by what we have to give up to give it. What a person gives up in order to give the money to God is something that the Lord does not overlook. If you buy a Big Mac, 
if you buy, no, let's say if you buy a, whatever they are, McDouble off the dollar menu, if there's still such a thing, instead of a Big Mac meal and give the difference to God, he notices that. If instead of having steak and lobster at a fine restaurant tonight, you go get a cheeseburger from Burger King or McDonald's or something like that, and you give the difference to God, he knows that. He notices that. David said, I will not give what has not caused cost me anything, or it has not caused me nothing. So the kind of giving that God appreciates is the kind of giving that costs us something. What could you do with that money that instead you're given to the Lord's work? God, God notices that, you see. 43. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, this poor widow hath cast in more than, than all they who have cast into the treasury. So she gave more than anybody else that day, according to Jesus. And here's why, 44. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. And clearly it pleases the Lord. And clearly he takes notice when his people give beyond the point of comfort, like this poor widow. And she didn't give to get anything back. She wasn't the word of faith advocate. She gave out of devotion to Almighty God. Otherwise, Jesus never would have commended her. She gave out of her, she gave beyond the point of her comfort level because of her devotion to God. And let me tell you something, it takes faith to do that. It takes a love for God and a heart for God to do something like that. Nobody twisted her arm. She did it because she wanted to. It takes a heart for God to give, to truly give. Faithful givers are faithful Christians. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, said Jesus. Chapter 13, and as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? The temple complex was very impressive. And the apostles are pointing it out to Jesus. Rightfully so. The temple complex was one of the top sites in the entire world of that day. The buildings were made of marble. Actually, the eastern wall was all gold-plated, if you can imagine that, in order to reflect the sunrise. It's true that the temple complex was a magnificent sight. Look at verse 2. Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. It was magnificent, but it will soon be destroyed because the people involved in that temple in the so-called worship of God at that place were not living for God, did not care about God, and will scream for the execution of his son in just a couple of days. In 70 AD, the Romans did in fact destroy Jerusalem and the temple. Just exactly as Jesus predicted. A million Jews were slaughtered and that temple was taken apart stone by stone. Just as Jesus predicted it would be. This is why every word of the Bible is absolutely essential. This is why all 31,000 plus verses, all the words of the Holy Bible must be taught, must be read, must be believed, must be taught because they are all inspired.
This is why I hate the modern trans. I hate all the modern translations, except for the King James, the New King James, and the slight updates to the Old King James, because they are based on the received text, the faithful text that was handed down throughout the centuries from the apostles. But these new translations, horrible, faulty text. And if you want to study that, you can click on my website and click on, or yeah, and click Bible translations, and it'll come up in depth study. But beyond the bad translations, which are all the modern ones, you have many of those translations who are even bad translations of bad text. The NIV, bad translation of a bad text. New Living Translation, bad translation of a bad text. The message, I'm not even going to go there, that's so horrendous. But any of these, any of these translations that claim to be thought-for-thought thought rather than word-for-word word translations do a horrible injustice to the written word of God, to the revelation of God, beyond even the corrupt text that they use because they leave out words. They compromise. NIV is notorious for this. It's such a popular translation, always was. They're notorious for just arbitrarily leaving out words. And every word is inspired by God. And we see it right here. Jesus didn't say, hey, you know what? That temple is going to be destroyed. It's going to, it's going to be completely destroyed by the Romans. Yes, sir. He said, no, stone by stone. He was very precise. And that's exactly what happened. Very precisely foretold by Jesus exactly what happened. The Romans took it apart stone by stone because they had heard a rumor that there was that the Jews when they built the temple mixed in gold with the mortar and so they took it apart stone by stone three and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives opposite the temple Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when, these, when all these things shall be fulfilled? The disciples believed that Jesus would establish the earthly kingdom of God within days from now. I know, I know he had told them several times that he was going to be murdered and betrayed, crucified, but I don't know, it just didn't sink in. They still think he's going to set up his kingdom within days probably before the Passover feast that's about to start, will be ended. So they want to know exactly when the temple will be destroyed and when the kingdom will be established. And they also want to know what to look for in the way of signs. They're probably expecting Jesus to say, well, there's going to be darkness at midday, or maybe a brilliant angel with a trumpet is going to proclaim the start of the kingdom, something like that. That's probably what they're thinking. So they say, tell us, when will these things be and what shall be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? Sun's going to move, turn to blood, right? Or the sun's going to go black, right? Stars going to jump all over the place, right? There'll be volcanoes in the clouds. Who knows? They're thinking something big. Five, Jesus answering them began to say, take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Jesus is talking about the time between his ascension and his return to earth. During that interval, which is now over 2,000 years, during that interval, which is, which is in the time that we are right now and have been since the church age began on the day of Pentecost, there will be many, Jesus said, who will pretend to be him, and many deceivers who will claim to speak for Jesus. Jesus says, don't be deceived by them. We'll say, you say, well, fat chance of 
not being deceived. If somebody comes along and says they're Jesus, how do I keep from being deceived? Stick to the Bible. Stick to the Bible and you will not be deceived. God says to the law and to the prophets, if they do not speak according to that word, then they have no light in them. The truths that separate Christianity from false religions are very clear in Scripture. They don't have to be interpreted. They just have to be read. They just have to be believed. I say it again. The truths that separate Christianity from false religions and false forms of Christianity who claim to speak for Jesus Christ, the truths that separate true Christianity, the church that Jesus started, from all other religions, including false Christianity and false churches, those truths are crystal clear in Scripture. And so it is easy, if you believe the Bible and read the Bible, it is easy to point out a church that is from God and a church that is not from God but is from hell. 7. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end is not yet. During the church age, Jesus is saying, now he's talking about this period, during the church age there will be many wars. But Jesus says, don't be alarmed. Wars by themselves are not a sign of his return. It's inevitable. Every time a war starts, some prophecy nut will write books or publish articles or get on the internet or something and start proclaiming Jesus Christ is returning. This is a sign. The latest war that just began a few days ago as I make this uh, recording is the one where Russia has attacked uh, the Ukraine. And sure enough, sure enough, there are people publicizing the fact that this, this is a sign of the end of the times. This is a sign that Jesus is returning, in spite of what Jesus says. See, that makes good headlines, and it brings in a lot of offerings, and it, and it sells a lot of books. But if people knew the Word of God, they wouldn't buy one single one of those books, and they wouldn't bother reading the article and give those opportunists, opportunists, opportunity to draw attention to themselves. God says, to the law and to the prophets, stick to the word. And during the church age, there's going to be many wars, Jesus said here in verse 7. But he says, don't be alarmed. Wars by themselves are not a sign of his return. And yet, it's just amazing how many books are written by opportunists every time a war breaks out. And of course, that's especially true when there is war or threat of war in the Middle East. The catalogs of Christian booksellers are stuffed with books with titles that include the words Middle East, Antichrist, Oil, War, Terrorism, Ayatollah, Iran, Iraq, Rapture, Second Coming. Well, those books sell, man. They sell big times. Lots of tainted money can be made by prophetic hype when a war breaks out. But war, even war in the Middle East is not necessarily a sign of the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, the end is not yet. Wars are the norm, unfortunately. Not just for this present age, but since the fall of man. The first, the first world war actually occurred when Cade, Cain killed his brother Abel. And there's been wars ever since. It's been going, it's been going ever since. Verse 8, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in various places, and there shall be famines and troubles, these are the beginnings of sorrow. So all of these things will happen. All the things that Jesus mentioned will happen, will be the norm during the present church age. 
And what did he mention? He talked about earthquakes, talking about famines. In other words, natural disasters. They've been happening for 2,000 years. Natural disasters are not necessarily a sign that the Lord will return soon. Jesus refers to them as birth pangs, which means that they will become more and more frequent and more and more intense as his return draws near, especially in the final few days. That's when they really get intense. That's when they become noticeably worse and more intense. So again, what Jesus has been saying, he, he, he's just been describing what the world in general will experience during this present church age. Next up, and we'll see this next time, what his followers can expect during these, during these times, during this church age. And we'll wait till next time. In the meantime, as I said earlier, you can study the whole Bible with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click and listen. And if you would like to be a part of this ministry and help me get out God's Word, be a part of this ministry, pray for me. That'll make you a part of this ministry. Pray for God's Word. That will also make you a part of this ministry. And when you take a break from studying at thebibleversebyverse.com, if God leads, go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. And until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.